this. They're fun. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think it's a good time. I got, I got wispies. I worked out this morning, so that's a good thing. Hello. Yes. Guys. <laughs> Excuse me. Should have done that before we started. It's a week <laughs> of training. Uh, me, Samantha Boss and Liam Marie are both here in all of our groups. We're in three groups live at the same time. Most of you are probably a member of all three groups. And if you're not, click around. We have Divorced and Empowered with Leah Marie, her group, Women Only, answer the membership questions to get in, and then my two groups, The Ugly Truth of Divorce um, and The Ugly Truth of Co-Parenting Both. So get into the group that matters the most to you. But we come on every Wednesday at 10 o'clock Central, 11 o'clock Eastern, which is also 8 o'clock Pacific Time, Mountain Time. I think you're 9 o'clock. I'm not real sure. Some Mountain Time people are 9, some are 10. I don't know. It's confusing. Um, but we posted earlier that you guys had questions and we were going to give a training on anger because I feel like I carried a lot of anger in my divorce. Um, and I'm just recently in the last eight years out of 16, not in that anger phase, but I know Liam Marie gets a lot of questions about anger when we're live on TikTok every morning, which by the way, you can catch us live on TikTok Tuesdays and Thursdays mornings, um, around eight o'clock central, nine o'clock Eastern. We go live and a lot of the questions are, how do I get over? How do I get over? How do I let this go? How do I not let it bother me? So we're going to tackle those questions today. So Lee Marie, what's going on with you today? Are you, what, what's happening in your life today as we let people catch in and, and start logging in? Yeah. So we don't have any lives today. I've got a podcast a little later. Uh, we won't be live tomorrow though, because you've got, you've got surgery, but we'll be back next Tuesday and Thursday. Um, so I'm actually just, I'm just doing some stuff on my website. I've got some new stuff on there. I've got my divorce recovery, a digital bundle that I tweaked a little bit. Um, and I love, I'm so, <laughs> it's like, so like, I, I wish I had this. I wish I had this when I was going through my divorce. So it's so great. Somebody just bought one this morning. Um, so that's kind of it. And then I've got some consultations later today. So that's what I'm up to. Good. I have um, a boot camp coming up. I just had a client right before this, um, a wonderful woman named Emily was on and and she was asking me questions about building her parenting plan. I was like, look, before you spend the money on building it first, attend the workshop for way cheaper. It's next week, March 6th, 7th, and 8th, um, on for an hour each day. And you get those replays. And that that for me, you know, I wish I would have had that too for my, my old self, my old avatar. And just there were so many things that I didn't know should have been in a parenting plan. So you guys can attend that as well. We both have stuff. Um, the links are all over our websites. But... We're going to jump right in. We're going to tackle some questions again. We were going to do a training, but then we saw how great your questions are. And we were like, why would we not just go there? Why would we not mm -hmm. just go ahead and start addressing those questions? So the very first question, um, which is very fitting, how do I address a trigger, especially when it happens almost daily? Um, and I'm just going to give my little two cents of dealing with somebody of high conflict. And then Liam Marie is actually going to coach us today on how to deal with this anger. But I'm going to give some examples of being triggered um, for me. I was triggered every time I pulled in the driveway to drop my kids off. My anxiety risen greatly. Every time I knew it was time for an exchange, I would get triggered with, what's he going to say? Is he going to yell at me? Is he going to confront me? Are the kids going to want to get out of the car? Um, every time I opened the mail and the mailbox back in the day when people used to mail me something. So for you guys now in 2020s, um, it's probably opening your inbox and seeing that letter from your email or seeing that message on OFW from your ex and you know that it's going to be problematic for you. Um, the other times would be when my kids would come back from exchanges. I got really triggered with them telling me how great he was when I knew he always did something great right before they left. So they would not remember the two days that they had of hell with him. He would, you know, buy them a puppy on the last day or take them for ice cream on the last day and sugarcoat whatever he had messed up on with them for the first two days. So I would get triggered very easily by the smallest things. And my family could not figure out like, Sam, why are you letting this bother you? Sam, why, why does this, you know, why are you letting this affect your mood? Why are you letting? And it was like, I don't know until I learned that I was the only thing that could control the boundaries of the triggers coming in. So Liam Reed, how, how mm -hmm. can we address some of these triggers to where we're not letting it affect our day to day? Cause once I got triggered, my day was lost. I was a bad mom. I was spiraling. I was crying. I was texting. Oh I was on the phone. I was obsessed with what was going on at that moment from the trigger. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so this is a perfect example. So I love this. So going back to what you were saying, your trigger was essentially was triggering the, these thoughts in your brain, right? These negative thoughts. What's going to happen? What is he going to say? I'm a shitty mom, right? So when you're getting triggered, it all comes back to first, okay, what is the emotion that I'm 
feeling? Okay, I know I'm triggered, but what is that exactly? What does that feel like in my body? What does that look like? Where is it? And every time you feel any kind of feeling, good or bad, it's directly related to the thought that you thought first, right? And so like the thought you're th like you were ruminating all day, you said I would get triggered and then like I would it would ruin my whole day because then I was just caught in this shit storm of just negative thoughts that would make me feel like shit, right? So when you find yourself triggered, first kind of let it happen, like don't resist, right? Because that means there's something that needs to be healed. If a trigger is basically like a, your body waving a flag going, hey, I'm still here. So first of all, let it kind of happen and then bring your attention to, to what feeling it is specifically. And then what thoughts are causing those feelings? What thoughts are going on in your brain? Because you can choose to think different thoughts. And that, that's why, and I use this as an example, there's different ways to do this, but the easiest way to start doing this and creating this new habit is using affirmations. Because whether or not you realize it, when you're triggered and you have all that negative self-talk going on, those are affirmations. They're just ones that make you feel like shit. So if you wanna stop feeling that way, it all comes to the thoughts that you're thinking. So you have to kind of pay attention to that, that self-awareness of, well, what conversations am I having? Like, I'm a shitty mom, what's gonna happen, right? So you change new thoughts. I'm, I'm a great mom. I forgive myself for my mistakes. I'm healing more every day. I'm learning more every day. I'm uh, accept, learning how to accept the things that I cannot change, right? That is huge. And so which that's, is that's opinion, what, which is his opinion of me. I can't yeah. Change. There's nothing that you can do about that. And so you're going to be met with that constant frustration if you have those expectations of, well, one day he's going to listen and he's going to see it my way. He's going to understand. He's going to stop being a dick, right? Those are all probably never going to happen. So you've got to lower your expectations, meet him where he's at, and gain acceptance for who he is so that you can move forward and focus on what you can't control. So it all comes back to paying for what, what feeling am I feeling exactly? Like, where is it coming from? And what shit is going on in my brain? That's what's making me feel that way. So when you can change that, you change the way you feel. And then I have a few, just a few uh, things here. So when you do get triggered, you want to, you have to regulate yourself again, right? When you're triggered, you're kind of like spun up. So you want to find a way to then self-regulate so that you can bring yourself kind of back down to earth. So four quick things. So number one, just taking a big ass deep breath. Okay. And one, one of the, I've talked to you about this too, a really good trick to help regulate your nervous system is two quick br breaths through the nose. You hold your breath for like five seconds and then you release slowly out the mouth. So it looks like this. Mm -hmm. And release all that air. And you could do that a few times in a row, 10 times in a row. That will literally calm your body back down and bring you back to center. Um, a second thing, and then taking a breather, like taking a break, is taking, you know, step aside, do something else, try to find, just taking a break from whatever it is that's triggering you. Uh, number three, like moving yourself, right? So like going for a walk, getting out in nature, doing something to help bring you into the present moment again. This is all about, I'm wound up, how do I bring myself back to center, right? So those are a few things. And then journaling, you guys, journal, journal, journal. It's free. It's accessible to everybody. You can grab a scrap sheet of paper from your kitchen junk drawer. Yeah. Just write that stuff down so that you can work through your own thoughts and feelings. Yeah. I had a mom last night call me, uh, emergency call last night. I, you know, it's one of the women that I coach, <clears throat> excuse me, and she found out that the GAL is going to propose 50-50 with a very high conflict abusive ex-husband with charges. And so she's spiraling, you know, she, and she was smart enough to reach out for help. She was smart enough to say, I need to talk. And so I got her on a zoom and we were talking and we, I mean, we talked for an hour, but what she did before she talked to me was she got on Google docs and she journaled all of her first instincts, all of her first thoughts. So when she came to me, we got to really like strategize about next steps and we didn't have to really waste a lot of time with the emotional part of it because she word vomited all of that onto paper real quick and sent it to me so I could read how, how she was feeling and how she was reacting. And and I know she felt better at the end of the hour because we had a game plan. Plus she said, go back and read my Google Docs because that's me just brain dumping all of my fears. And you know, and you kept talking about something like when I can remember pulling in the driveway to my ex's house and just that gut wrenching feeling of like, what's going to come of me? What's, what's he going to say? What's he going to do? And I was living in that fear of what will he say? 
because for eight years for me, I let his words, his, his words, his thoughts, his opinions be more important than my own. I didn't have the confidence to know that no matter what was coming out of his mouth wasn't true. And I, and I knew it wasn't true. I didn't believe that. I believe sometimes when he would say, you're a shit mom, you're picking other people, you're, you're having a social life over your kids. I would be like, maybe I am a bad mom. Maybe I shouldn't have friends. Maybe I shouldn't go out with people. Maybe I shouldn't go to that concert. And he was winning because he was so deep in my head. I was letting him live in there for rent free for years. And instead I was like, I can go to a fucking poison concert and still be a badass mom. Like yeah. I guarantee in that stadium, there is a lot of fucking moms in that stadium, you know, like, but I had him making me believe that his words were more powerful than my own feelings about myself because my confidence yeah. was so low when I pulled in that driveway. And when I got that confidence back, man, I was pulling that driveway, rolling the window down. I'm like, what are you doing today? Like I, I talked with such confidence and I still do to this day eight years ago, the first eight, you guys, it was a soup sandwich. I would roll my window down and be like, do you need anything? Uh, you know, do you need me to do this mm -hmm. for you? Do you need me to remind you? Do you need me to send you a text? Oh, um, I mean, I can, I'm embarrassed even how I acted back then because I was fearful. I didn't have enough confidence. And I was always, I was always living in fear, fear. He was going to get mad fear. He was going to yell at me fear. I was going to go back to court fear. The kids wouldn't like me fear. The kids would believe him. It was just this constant. And he was my trigger. And what I realized is I was putting myself in his life more than what was needed. I was going out of my way to call him, text him, include him, sit by him, uh, you know, offer favors. Off and it's like, why do you keep beat? Why do you keep going over to get yourself beat up? Like quit, eliminate him. He's not coming to you. You don't see him walking across the softball field to you, but you go over there, like quit triggering yourself. So I think mm -hmm. some of you really need to look at what are you doing to get triggered? Are you, as soon as it goes, ding, ding, you're like, oh, what do he say? What do he say? If you're not in a good place, you don't pick up that phone. If you don't have support staff on standby, you don't pick up the phone. You don't open the piece of mail. You don't click on the inbox. You guys have to know what your triggers are because a lot of you in the early phases are just going to blame them. Well, he's my problem. He's the trigger. No, you are letting him be your trigger. You are taking that boundary down, pushing that wall down and just letting him walk all over you, letting your attorney interrupt your workday, letting your attorney interrupt your parenting time with your kids. That email is going to be there at eight o'clock when your kids go to bed. There's no reason you're opening that at five o'clock when you come home from work and you're supposed to be enjoying your children and you're making the mistake of opening that email. Just like I would get the, the mail out of the mailbox and open it before we'd even walked in the door. I'm already in a shit mood because I triggered myself. Why was I doing that? You know, that's what my mom finally mm -hmm. said to me one day. She goes, why do you keep opening the fucking mail? Just wait or give it to me and I'll open it and decipher it for you, whether you should read it or not. Like, stop. You're doing it to yourself. And it was like, yeah, oh, he finally tells you that. And you see that. it. Oh, shit. I am. I am extending myself too much into his life to where he has ammunition to come at me. That's my bad. You know, mm -hmm. and I had to clean house. I had to clean house and stop doing that. So. I think yeah, that you've got to take responsibility. Yeah, yeah it, it was me too. I was allowing him to do that. Okay. Uh, how do you not react to the HCP constant attempts to get a reaction through their behavior? So this kind of just ties into what we were saying. Um, mm -hmm. of not allowing him to be in your head, not allowing that HCP person to be in your life. I mean, mm -hmm. you guys, for me, it was a, I pick up my phone and be like, oh, I should tell. Mm, no, I don't need to tell him. I am not legally bound to tell him how they did on a test today. Therefore I'm not. And for some of you, you might say, well, why wouldn't you tell them how they did on a test? Because if I said, oh, they got an 80, he'd be like, oh, did you not study with them last night? Because they should have got an A. And then the good news of the, what I think the potential of my son to get a B was, was great. It was great news. He would beat me up that the kid didn't get an A. Yeah. And it would just, so I would catch myself for eight years, picking up the phone. I would always do it. The last eight years, I still pick up the phone sometimes. And I'm like, I should tell him nothing because he won't yeah. look at it the way I look at it. And that's the thing. So again, part of that is just acceptance, accepting what kind of a person you're dealing with. If it's a high conflict person, if it was not a high conflict person, what you're doing is just thoughtful. It's just, a, it's just courteous. Hey, this is the grade. And if it was a normal, mm -hmm. rational person, then they would say, oh, great. Or, oh, good job or whatever. Right. High conflict people and like narcissists, people like that, they're not normal. They're not us. They don't, they, they aren't looking to try to find that common ground with you. All they want to do is manipulate, push your buttons, piss you off, make you feel less than. 
and they will always be like that. So you have to be mindful of what kind of person you're dealing with so that you know whether or not you should even be doing things like that. Because if it's not going to be received or appreciated, then don't do it. And that's how you set those limits is you're, you set the boundaries yourself. When you can't change the kind of person they are, you can't change the actions that they take, then you change what actions you're taking and how you're reacting to that kind of bullshit. So set those boundaries. Sometimes you don't have to interact at all. If they're sending you messages or emails or whatever, unless it's something that's absolutely necessary in order for you to be conversing about, just don't even say anything. Just leave it, right? And go and do something that makes you feel a little bit better. If they're constantly pushing those boundaries, sometimes you have to just walk away. Like if it's in person, go do something else. Walk into the other room, lock yourself in the bathroom. Find a way to just disengage. Do not engage in that interaction or conversation if you know that it's not going to get you anywhere. Yeah, and, and I think a lot of people, when when you guys hear some of this stuff, I know some of you are thinking, this is so cliche stuff, like affirmations and walk away and do some breathing. It is. It yeah. is fucking simple. Like I paid a shit ton of money to a therapist to do breathing exercises with me. I paid a shit ton of therapists, a shit ton out of network to have me journal every day and bring my journal. Like this is stuff that you could pay high, high dollar to have someone do for you out of network or in your network through your insurance. Or you could just hear from us and take the stuff that Leah Marie has on her website and use it. It is mm -hmm. that simple, but I think sometimes when we're so into it, I mean, we are, we are knee deep in a pile of shit 24 seven when we have somebody high conflict that it might take the people in your support staff, your friends, your family to tell you, Sam, you're the one driving over there. You're the one standing by him. You're the one texting him. You're the one call. You might have to have some tough love given to you that you are part of the problem. Cause like Liam Marie keeps saying, you got to know who you're dealing with. Some of you are literally driving yourself insane because you keep going to this person thinking you're going to get a different reaction. You know, for, for 16 years, you all, I have tried to share great news with my ex-husband. Look at her mow the yard. Look at her do this. I sent highlight video of her volleyball game. And he's like, but you didn't get the one thing. Dude, what are you talking about? There's three minutes of highlights and you're telling me I missed one. Like, did you put a fucking highlight video together? But I used to think, oh, you're right. I did miss that one video. Damn, the whole thing's shit now. I'll go try to find it. I'll go see if a parent ha Fuck that, dude. I took my time. I recorded. I. It's a kick-ass video. Don't fucking watch it then. Like, mm -hmm. you have to ask yourself, how are you putting yourself in these situations? And I think some of you, when, when you're in it, me, eight years, I, I was in it. I couldn't see that I was the problem because I kept thinking, no, he's the, he's the mean one. He's the attacker. He's this, he's, and it's like, no, I was the one walking back into the ring every time waiting to get sucker punched instead, because honestly, guys, if I'm being truthful, I wanted him to like me. I wanted him to get along with me. I wanted him to want to co-parent. I wanted my kids to have that lifetime special moment where everybody's just, we're wearing matching shirts and we're doing it. Like I wanted that so bad that I couldn't see the reality in front of my face is that this motherfucker hated my guts and was never, ever going to, sh to share bread with me. Never. Ever. And, and that, that was not your fault, right. right? That's the other thing. It's like, that's not your fault. That's his choice. Right. Right. And it took a long time, but once I realized we were never going to break bread together, it's a game changer. It's a game yeah. changer to go. He's just like an employee at work that you can't fucking stand. You know what you do? You stop walking past their cubicle. You stop going to lunch hour at the same time. You park your car in a different spot. You avoid mm -hmm. the coworker you can't fucking stand. He's the coworker you don't like. You avoid at all. But when you're stuck in the same business meeting, you're like, head down, focus, do what I have to do, walk out, shake, yes, no, out. You mm -hmm. don't say, how was your weekend? Because you don't give a shit. Don't ask. Don't ask. So, I mean, I think some of you need to go to your people in your support and ask, am I doing shit to cause some of this and be ready? They're going to give you some hard answers if you can't see them yourselves. You know, my therapist simply said, stop driving past his house. There's different roads you could go on. But yeah. I, it's, it's just, you're choosing to go past his house and trigger yourself. You're a stalker. Yeah. Stop doing it. You're, <laughs> wanting, you're wanting to trigger yourself. You're, you're curious and you're go the other way. 
Oh. And we all have blind spots. That's the thing. Like as humans, yeah. we're just all caught up in our own thing. Like we get in these habits and in these patterns. So sometimes it's not that you're like stupid, like, duh, why didn't I think of that? You just don't see things from other perspectives sometimes because you're just stuck in your own. And so that's what's great about getting help or having a more objective view, therapy, working with a coach, getting into a support group, because it helps show you what those blind spots are not so that you can beat yourself up over it so that you can change it so that you can make new choices and get different results. Yeah. All right. The next one, ways to regroup the anger and redirect it to not lash out at others. For me, it was lashing out at my kids. Like I would open the mail, get triggered. Yeah. And then as soon as I'm triggered, I'm going to call my mom so I can bitch. And, and the kids are like, but we want a snack. And I'm like, go play, just go play, get in the other room and go play. And the anger, I mean, I could probably tear up if I really thought about how many years they heard me say that. Go to the other room and go play. I have to get on the phone. I have to talk to this. I have, And I shoved them into another room and said, but I have to deal with this right now. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know how to do the breathing. I didn't know how to not open the mail. I didn't know how to just pause. A lot of you guys is just let the, emo like Lee Marie said, feel the emotions. Let it sit there without calling and dumping it. As my mom says, I always call and dump it on my mom. And then my mom's like, you just, all you did was just pass it to me. Now I'm pissed, you know? And like, I wish I would have done a better job of opening the mail or not, but sitting there and let it just, it is what it is. It's five o'clock. Can't change it today. I might as well enjoy my kids. But instead I would say, go play, mm -hmm. pick that up and go play. And then I'm manifesting over here in this horrible life that I have. And uh, my life is shit. Blah, blah, blah. And my mom would be like, you know, what's your kids doing? They're, they're fine. They're playing. And then you hear them come in, mom, can we, no, I'm on the phone. And I would be so hateful. And then I would go to bed after they're already asleep and nobody's around. And I'd cry. Like I didn't play Guilt. with them. I didn't talk yeah. to them. I'm a horrible mom. And then when mm -hmm. he would say, you're a piece of shit, mom, I'd go, you're right. Yesterday I did. I yelled at them. I was distracted. And so his narrative, why it hurt so bad was it was true some days. And so it made it a bigger deal. It made, it made it hurt more. And so it, it really does start you guys with the triggers and the boundaries. She's trying to teach you that if not, you are going to lose years with your kids. Yeah. And when you're pissed, when you have that anger, it's, it's energy, right? Ener emotions are energy in motion. So when you're feeling these big emotions like anger, you've got to let it out because if you're not intentional about how you're letting it out, then unintentionally, it's going to come out onto other people like your kids or your coworkers or whatever your parents, right? So when you know that you're all worked up, find ways to essentially open that gate and let that shit out. And so a, a great, great way to do this is get your body moving, move, exercise, lift heavy things. Yes. Go for a run, go for a swim, like whatever you like to do. Kickboxing. I had, I had somebody today was like, I have a kickboxing class and it's so, it's so helpful. I'm going to put a, a bag in my basement. Um, doing those things releases that so that you're not so wound up. And once you get some of that angry energy out, you can kind of calm down again. And then your perspective is totally different because if you're seeing red, you're not going to be making decisions that serve you. You right. have to, you have to kind of, decompress and, and let that out before you want to keep going and music music is so therapeutic put a playlist together whether it's one that just relaxes you or it's one that's like or like something shit like fucking rock music like just do it like do something like scream the lyrics like sing like do you know dance around kick jump like just get that angry energy out whatever songs like pump you up like i have a gym playlist right when i'm at the gym there's songs that i listen to that like pump me up so you can find music that does that for you too yeah and i and i think what we have to tie this into is you're having one of those raging moments of frustration, anger, you're pissed off with something you read or a text or whatever it caused you to get there. Your kids are watching and it's okay to show them, you know what? Mom's at a 10. So you know what we're going to do? We're going to turn on that fucking headbanger music and we're all, we get to scream because we're at my house and their kids, they were not allowed to scream unless somebody was chasing them with a murdering machine. So like <laughs> they were not allowed to scream. So it was their one time to scream. So crank the music up really loud for one song. They get to scream the next song yeah. they're dancing and laughing. And by the third song, it's a little bit more mellow and I have deregulated myself, but my kids also saw me escalate 
and work myself down from a red mm -hmm. to a green. My kids saw me at a 10 and I got down to a two or three. And so they saw me to where they're more likely to mirror my behaviors and go, mom, I'm angry. I need something to get me down. And they know that they have to go find their own coping skills, which I'm going to put all of this kind of stuff, these mm -hmm. little tips and tricks that I learned mm -hmm. along the way um, into a course that I'm putting out this spring called co-parenting coaching um, for you guys, because music in our house was hands down a healer for all of us to be able to communicate our frustrations. Kids would come in and mm -hmm. put their headphones on. You could hear the music through the headphones of what they were listening to. But by the time I walked in 30 minutes later, they were watching a show and they were way more calm. So you're going to find yeah. what you need to, but how you're coping with your anger, your kids are watching. They're a sponge. Yes. So if you're picking up the bottle and drinking a beer, glass of wine, another glass, they see that. If you're going outside to excuse yourself to smoke the 13th cigarette before dinner, they see that. They see you not having good coping skills with your frustration, your angers, and your triggers. And so yeah. what are you teaching them? To shut down and leave? To not be around people? To not ask for help? To, to shut, you know, be quiet or to lash out when you're angry? I mean, I, I couldn't even tell you how many times when my kids, when I would yell at my kids about something I was pissed about. I'm pissed about my ex-husband. I'm pissed about work. I'm pissed that I don't have money to pay the fucking water bill. And I would lash out at them. Within an hour, I'm in their room begging for forgiveness that I could not keep my shit together, that I lashed out for the wrong reasons. I'm the one with the issue. I'm the one that's angry. You did nothing. I apologize. Do you know how many times that doesn't happen at the other house where they get lashed out at and there's no apology? There's nobody saying, I mishandled myself. I mishandled myself. I, I, I took my emotion and tried to dump it into you and I shouldn't have done that. So be thinking all the time when you're angry, frustrated, sad, what are you showing your kids for that coping to get mm -hmm. through it, to deescalate, mm -hmm. to push through that moment that you always call your mom and you push them away like I did? I did that for four years. Four fucking years. I pushed them away and talked on the phone with my mom. And my mom and I regret that because it's they remember it. <laughs> my kids remember yeah. it. That's for sure. It's fixable, yeah. though, because I didn't do it the rest of the time. I learned the music tricks. I learned the breathing exercises. My kids got, you know, um, uh, what a punching bag that they could kick when they were frustrated. My kid threw forks at trees. I taught them coping skills when they were frustrated, but I had to find my own first. And mine was working yeah. out. Mine was working out, man. I, when mm -hmm. I was this, I'm like, I got to go outside and I would work out. Yeah. And that builds your confidence. Bonus. Oh, extra yeah. bonus you're still gonna feel better about yourself but yeah screaming i love that you brought that up because i forgot to mention that too a good old primal scream girl sometimes that's all you need into a pillow grab a pillow and scream bloody murder and that will feel like such a release right um we have this question that I, I think hits home for a lot of people it was a longer question so i shortened it but basically what she's saying is after she gets the kids back she gets berated by her ex with 15 plus messages and she doesn't even know where to start on replying back. And I'm just here to tell you, if you're getting berated, the court system is, is going to see that message, message, but that's not a normal behavior. And I know you might think it's normal because it's all you've known, that this is just how he communicates. You're not going to look bad if you ignore and only answer specifics. If there's not a question, there's no response. If there's just allegations, there's only a statement of, you know, that's not true. And that's it. You don't accept that's it. it. You, do you don't have, have to justify. justify. You don't have to answer all those questions. Mm -mm. You don't even have to answer all the questions unless it's something really important. And if he's just talking about, you know, why are they in these shoes or why are they, you know, I mean, that's shit that you don't even have to respond to when you're dealing with somebody like that. Not to mention if the kids are with you, they're safe. So what's the urgency to respond? I would put that shit on red for hours until my kids are asleep sound. I have my support system ready to go. And I respond to the things I need to legally respond to. And that's it. If this, and also don't respond to shit that's resourceable. What I mean is what time is the dentist appointment? Motherfucker, you can call the dentist appointment because I, or look back through the messages. I sent that a long time ago. I'm not repeating myself. What time's the class play? Look on the internet like everybody else. Read the email that you got, just like I did. Are you paying for school pictures? No response. A lot of you feel like you have to respond because you, you've been trained. You've allowed him to train you that way, but also you're fearful of how's it going to look in court? Well, I don't want to look bad. You're not going to look bad because you told him once already what time the dentist appointment was. 
The internet can tell him what time the play was. The school pictures, he got the same fucking email you did. We're not hand-holding anymore. So stop doing that part. So again, it's teaching them. You have to teach them that you have boundaries now. But the second you start responding to those 15 messages, you're retraining. You have to go back and start on day one again. Because now they think, aha, so if I ask 15 questions instead of 14, she'll respond. If I send them all together, she'll respond instead of just dragging them out. You're training them with how you respond. Mm -hmm. So you'll never get the messages to stop until A, they find something else to entertain themselves. Or B, you train them that no matter how many times they come for you, and it might take six to eight months, you guys, six to eight months. There's no easy fix because you can't control them. But the second you give in, it's going to continue even longer. It sucks. It totally sucks. But during that time, while you're ignoring and building your boundary and retraining him, you work on your confidence that, okay, this is a good decision. I am okay with not responding. I, it is appropriate mm -hmm. not to respond. I have confidence that I'm making a good decision. Like you have to keep that going because the second you have weakness, you'll text back. Yeah. And, and don't beat yourself up about that self-doubt. Like, listen, it, it, it makes so much sense that this happens to us because when we're in a relationship with someone, when, we, when we're in love with someone, when we're spending, sharing our lives with someone, that person knows us more intimately than any other human on this planet, right? They know more about you. They know you better than anyone. So when they start talking shit and telling you you're a piece of shit or you're not good enough or you're a liar or you're a shitty mom, you're like, damn, like, maybe I am. Maybe that's true. This person knows me really fucking well. Like this person knows, sees all of my decisions and all, and all the things that I'm doing. So we get in that habit of almost believing what they say because we trust their perspective, right? So it's just a habit. You just, it's creating new habits. It's learning to change your thought process and not listening to their voice anymore and trusting yours. Yeah. So this one kind of goes right into that. You know, Facebook user says, Mine's stubborn over two years of ignoring and he still pushes it. Now we're going to court for alienation. To me, I would ask for my court fees to be paid for by him because if this information is able to have access from the outside, from the school district, from being on the email list, which is what you should have in your parenting plans, it should say both parties are responsible for ensuring that the school district has my contact information. The coaches should have my contact. It's not my job to give my ex-husband's information when it's already in the system. I don't have to go give him and say, hey, did you get that email? Hey, did you do that? And it's his responsibility, even if it says in my paperwork that I'm supposed to register the kids for school and give his contact information, even if it says that, let's say I don't comply. If I were dad, I sure as hell better call the school the first week of school and say, just want to make sure. Do you have my email address so I get the same emails that she gets? Perfect. That's all I needed. Thank you. But it's this lack of responsibility. So if this gentleman or woman, whoever this is, takes you to court for alienation, please show me where I didn't invite you to something that you didn't have access to know about. Please show me how I didn't, like you couldn't call the dentist office. You couldn't call and say, does my child have an appointment in the next six months? A lot of people will claim alienation because they don't want to do the work. Now, can alienation exist? Absolutely. But you got to make sure that you have done, as the, primary parents taking care of that. You've done your due diligence. I have sent the OFW message that said what time the dentist appointment. It just happened to be six months ago when I made the appointment. So yeah, you might have to scroll back, but I told you not my fault. You didn't put it on your own personal calendar. As long as you're doing your due diligence of all you're obligated and legally bound to do, this is, this is a shot in the dark. And I'd ask for my lawyer fees to be paid for <laughs> hands down, hands down. I would, because this is the kind of shit. So they're trying to use intimidation. I'm going to take you to court because you're not doing enough for me as the secretary of our household. The fuck? No, thank you. No, mm -hmm. absolutely not. So, all right, Liam Marie, what do you got coming up? We talked about it at the beginning, but what do you got coming up? So what I'm working you, on, what do we have coming up? Yeah. So the, so your divorce. So on March 17th, we have got another divorce squad workshop. It's the ultimate divorce workshop. It is myself helping you through the healing part of it, the mental and emotional part of divorce. It's Sam helping you with the uh, parenting plans and, and co-parenting with a high conflict person. Uh, we've got Alex, who's a divorce planning coach. So if you're in, your, in those early stages, you were considering a divorce, she's amazing because she helps you prep and organize and get this, the documents together. So that's way less overwhelming. 
And then we've got Ebony. So she's the money coach. She helps you get your money in order, save your money, figure out how to budget, how to get out of divorce debt, all that stuff. All four of us for an hour for 47 bucks. Right. Come. It's amazing. And even if you can't come to the live workshop, if you're enrolled, you get access, you get 30 day access to the replay. So we're so stoked. We did it last month. It was great. We got amazing feedback. It was so fun. Uh, and we're doing it again, March 17th. Right. Okay. So we're going to get to any more questions that you guys have. So put those right now inside the live. We're going to give you kind of what's going on in our lives. And then we'll answer some of the last few questions because we do have two or three more. So stick around, stick on. Um, the only things that I really have coming up is that workshop that she just talked about, but I also have my every month. You guys know this. I run my boot camp slash workshop. I'm calling it a workshop now um, on March 6th, 7th, and 8th. So if you're thinking about building a parenting plan to give to your attorney or to give your ex, join me. It's three days. It's an hour each day. The replays get sent to you. If you're at work, that's fine. Um, you can engage with the replay and send emails to me. That is something you need if you have no idea what is invested into a parenting plan. If you are just like, hey, I'm in the midst of a divorce. I keep hearing this parenting plan word and I don't know. And my ex hates my guts and I don't think it's going to go well for me. You need to be at the boot camp because you're not only going to learn what goes into a parenting plan. You're also going to learn what it is like to go to your attorney and tell them why you need the detail you're asking for. How to present it to your ex and try to get them talked into having this detailed parenting plan because details are the way to go. So join me with that. Um, everything again on SamanthaBoss.com. And then Lee Marie, what do you personally have going on? Yeah. So anybody, if you're, if you feel stuck, if you're dealing with anger, resentment, or guilt, shame, low self-confidence, self-doubt, book a consult with me. I could talk to you on zoom one-on-one -on -one for 45 minutes and give you a shit ton of tools and information. Yeah. So that you can feel better. Like you don't have to be stuck. You don't have to deal, deal with this. Uh, so book a consultation, you go to my website. I've also got my divorce recovery digital bundle. You can grab that. That is perfect for you if you want to start. It's like a, if you want an easy way to start your healing, building your self-esteem, working through that negative self-talk, how to right. find yourself again, how to adjust to being alone, like how to cope with loneliness, right? That is a great place to start. It's, it's a bunch of digital resources that you can have you immediately download. Right. Um, and then I'm working on a boundary workshop. So coming soon will be a workshop helping you understand boundaries, who you need them for, why you need them and how to set them and not feel guilty about it. Perfect. All right. We got a question coming in. It says, um, what help can call me when reading his text messages through OFP? Got it. I tend to read them as he spoke to me with the attitude and anger. Okay, so you can have a, if you're really intense, you can have a buffer. I would always have my mom read messages and let me know what it said. And then I would think of a response back and forth with my mom. Um, and I don't know how that would work with OFP or OFW, I think is what it's supposed to be. But for me, it's get yourself in a good place. Like I remember that, that I always got divorced, you guys, when t 9 was cool. So like it took me a while to respond, right? We had to bump, 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 bump. And for those of you that don't know what that is, you're lucky. But t 9 took forever to respond to stuff because you had to shorten your uh, words because you didn't want to be texting that much. But for me, it was getting myself into a better place. The first probably four years, I answered everything immediately, caused problems, go play reaction with my kids because I didn't do it. After that, I would leave stuff on red. I would go exercise, music, eat, have support system on standby, have a girlfriend come over and help me decipher or just wait till the next day. A lot mm -hmm. of you were overly responding to soon. So in my parenting plan, I have standard communication of stuff that's not urgent, urgent communication and emergency communication. And we put specific examples of what qualifies that if this is a standard, like what time is picture day, I'm not answering that shit for maybe 72 hours because I'm going to train you to go look for it. So for me, it's, you have to regulate yourself. You have to find a lot of the key things that Liam Marie can teach you on how to get yourself calm. That breathing thing, don't overlook that. Don't overlook something as simple as regulating your breathing. Because when we start to get anxious, like, oh, oh, I'm going to cry. I'm going to cry. And, and, and the anger, just your face gets red. You're pitting out. Your ass is tense. And the breathing, calm. What would you say? Yeah. So for something like this, you can also be proactive. So if you're using an app, then you know the only person that's message messaging you on there is him, right? Or her, whoever it is, he, him. So prepare, be proactive about it. So before you even read that notification, 
do something to get yourself to a place where you feel grounded and centered and almost have a mantra in your mind. Whatever he says, it's not going to bother me. Whatever he says, I'm going to be fine. Whatever he says, doesn't matter, right? Like use those mantras to prep. And then when you read it, you may not even want to reply right away. Just read it and then set it back aside. Don't take things personally. And I know that that's way more easily said than done, but high conflict for conflict people, they, they're playing a game. They're playing a game with you. They want to piss you off. They want to push your buttons. They want to work you up. They don't want to communicate lovingly with empathy and compassion. So play that game back. Know that whatever they say, they're trying to piss you off. They're trying to work you up. So just think about it that way. Don't take things so personally. Don't, don't keep them close to your heart as if what they're saying is true or what they're saying means you you did something wrong. So um, I did this trick whenever my mom and I would go to court. Oh, well, my mom wasn't there. But I would call her. We played bingo. Um, and what that means is we, we, I would be at court waiting. Again, we went 300 times, you guys. It was a fucking like, it was an event all the time. So in the eight, the eight years, we went 300 times. So we would play bingo. And meaning when he got off the elevator, we would play, everybody would already have their predetermined guesses on text message of what he would be wearing. Is it going to be the green polo shirt? Is it going to be the orange polo shirt? Is it going to be the sketcher boots or the work boots? I mean, he only had limited option. And it was a way for me to take the anxiety of court into something funny to be like, oh, mom got it. She got the blue shirt and the jeans and the stretch and sketcher boots. Like, you know, we played that game. So what I had one of my other private clients do was I had her take a piece of paper and I had her, I said, write everything down that he could possibly say about you. That's negative. Just brain dump all the shit. You're fat. You drink too much. You're lazy. All you do is use my money. You know, you're a horrible mom. You never are home. All the shit, all the shit he's ever wanted to say, or the high conflict parent has ever said about you, or you think they're going to say, and then you get to play bingo when they text you and go, aha. <laughs> oh, he said that one. Oh, called it. it. I knew he called it. Come up soon. And it becomes more of a game for you. Yeah. And you've already, you've already read the negative shit because you're the one that fucking wrote it. You already yeah. wrote the negativity, negativity down. So then when you read it, you're like, oh, it took him a week, but he finally mentioned that again. And it's a game. And then you get to call and kind of laugh a little bit when you talk to your support system about, yep, he brought it up again. Yep. And it doesn't come as a shock because you already have it down on your bingo card as a possibility that it could come up. But I'm telling you that court bingo about what they're going to wear Dude, that, I would like, every time the elevator would ding, ding, I'd be like, who's going to win? Who's going to win? And, you know, my mom won most of the time. I don't know if she was logging it and keeping track of what he wore, but she always knew what rotation he was on. Um, but it makes it a little bit more fun. All right, last question. How do you handle FaceTimes with my kids when he constantly monitors and interrupts them? I try to make them make my love known. Uh, so this is at his house, I'm assuming. That's the way I read that, right? So I am one that number one, I don't like phone calls with high conflict people for this reason. You're going to fuck with my time. You're going to try to inject yourself, whether either way this phone call is happening from mom's house or dad's house. I don't like the phone calls with high conflict. I do like, however, if you are doing them to talk in code. Um, we had different phrases for I love you. We had different phrases for I miss you to where if because if my ex-husband heard that, if he heard my kids say I miss you, mom. He would have came in that room and said, no, you don't. You just told me you want to live with me. And then my kids will be like, oh, my God, I did say that. But I only told you that to make you happy. So you'd stop yelling at me. Maybe now my mom heard me say that. Now I hurt my mom. And it was too much drama. So I eliminated the phone calls because of that shit was happening. So mm -hmm. we talked in code. We'd give hand signals across the court from each other because he would never let me talk to them after sporting events. Um, we got to where we just had our own language, our own grunts, uh, you know, our twin interaction kind of, as you say. But. When it comes to these phone calls, make them short, make them sweet. You don't have to profess your love for your kids. You don't. Yeah, that's that's what I was going to say. Your kids know that you love them. If you're dealing with somebody like that, then it may be better to just not do it. And that's okay. That's the hard thing about divorce is you are going to lose some time with your kids. This is just what happens. You don't have to FaceTime with them every day that they're with their dad. You just don't. I mean, and especially if you're saying it, it, you try to keep it quick because the, the kids are getting uncomfortable. Well, if you know that the kids are getting uncomfortable, don't do it. You're talking about you now. You're talking about you saying you feel like you need to do it for you, right? Mm -hmm. So if the kids are uncomfortable, 
just don't do it. And I know it's hard at first, but you get used to it. This is the time where you focus on you. When your kids are gone, it's like, okay, shit, now what can I do for me? How can I pass the time? How can I fulfill myself? Your kids know that you love them. They do. You don't even need to talk to them every day for them to know that. Yeah, because they're going to get in trouble for saying it back to you. So that's not even worth putting your kids in that kind of that kind of spot of having them have to feel that way. So so I would completely eliminate those if you can, um, if, if that's something that you can try to avoid, because it's just more harm for your kids to have to deal with as soon as that that phone calls over, it's going to come into oh no, you know, like, what'd you say to her? I called it the spotlight. You know, he'd be like, what'd you say? Who was at her house? What was she doing? And it was like, why is that five minute phone call worth it to my kids? Cause they get anxious. As soon as they know, Hey, your mom's calling. They're like, Oh fuck, we gotta, we gotta watch what we say. We can't tell her that we can't tell her that. So what the hell are we going to say when she says, what are we doing? Cause we're not allowed to tell her. And so it just wasn't worth it to me. Um, but if you do have the phone calls, please don't make them mandatory. Don't put specific times and dates. The only thing I would do on time is that it has to be sometime before dinner time at six o'clock. Call anytime you want after work before six. But once I have dinner with my kids, my bra's coming off, I'm relaxing, and I'm not getting my fucking ass all puckered with anxiety because I hear the phone ring for him calling. No, I want to have a, just a time where I know it's my time to, it's my visitation time. Fuck the phone calls at seven o'clock, eight o'clock. And please don't have these phone calls in your children's bedrooms. Your children's bedrooms are supposed to be their sanctuary of peace where they can fall asleep, not be triggered with an, a fucking phone call with a high conflict parent yelling at them or threatening them or telling them, go tell your mom this, go to don't ruin their bedroom. Okay. Let them have, you know, the front living room, let them go sit on the back porch. If they're little kids, you get a fucking tripod, wherever mine is a tripod. You put the phone on the tripod, you strap your kids to a high chair and you say, you got 10 minutes. He's eating. You got 10 minutes. He's playing with Play-Doh. You got 10 minutes. He's got watercolors. And that's it. And okay, time the timer's going off in the kitchen. Kiddo, it's time to go. Say bye-bye. That's it. You guys, you got to control your freedom. Your freedom with your kids is your time. Don't let somebody tell you what to do during your parenting time. Try to eliminate the phone calls as best you can because there is nothing but problems when it comes to those. Okay. All right, guys, this has been your training uh, for Wednesday. We are here every Wednesday um, at 10 o'clock Central, 11 o'clock Eastern, 8 o'clock Pacific time. And we are on live Tuesdays and Thursday mornings on TikTok, answering your questions for free, answering your questions for free in here. But we do have things that we can help you with one-on-one. -on -one. We have opportunities for you to buy electronic stuff that you can get bundled into your inbox today. You could start healing today. You could start building your parenting plan today. Or, spring is coming. Spring is coming. This yeah. is a perfect time to, to turn over that new leaf, to get yourself feeling good again, to get yourself to a place where you feel confident. This is the time. Right. And, and the only thing that we're going to say, like we do all the time, we get on here, we love on you guys. We share golden nuggets. We give you some advice. You, you give us great feedback. You appreciate it. But then you stay in the same rut because you don't take action. You don't start implementing. You don't start doing stuff that we've told you. So get a good support system. And if you need accountability, then you hire the accountability. You get somebody in your support group to be your pen pal and you have accountability for pushing those boundaries to show that you're worth it because you are worth it as a parent, a new single parent, you are worth it. Your life should be starting over, not going down the same path. So the time is now. Yeah, spring is here. Let's do this. That's right. Let's have an amazing summer and feel fucking badass and feel good about ourselves. Right. So you guys, we're always here. Tag us in our support groups. If you have a question you really want us to answer, make sure you're tagging us in that question. Otherwise, you're just going to get great support from great people within our, in our support groups. We have great moderators that are trying to keep it safe and friendly and positive. Remember, if you're not encouraging, educating or entertaining, your comment is kicked out. So make sure you're giving that kind of advice. All right, guys. Nice. Take care of yourselves and we'll, we'll be back next week, if not sooner. Bye.